Praise God. Hallelujah. Prayer warriors. Today we have a different backdrop or setup. Um, ask, seek, and knock. The scripture out of Luke 11, 9 through 13. And the door will be open to you. Power prayer warriors this morning. We're reading in our scripture reading today in Genesis chapter 13, verses 5 through chapter 15, 21. We're in Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, chapter 5, verse 27 and 48. That'll be a while. We are read Psalm 6 and Proverbs 1, verses 29 through 33. Well, here's the story of how Abraham and Lot separated. The blessing of God is so great in their lives that their herds and their possessions just increase that they have to separate. And Lot takes the plane, you know, by Sodom, and it's a lot greener, and Abraham's like, go for it, man, whichever way, God's going to bless no matter what. You know, a lot of times, you know, I really believe that when we so much want to do what we think is right, here we see Abraham's open heart of, hey, man, it's all, all of this is God's. He's going to bless no matter where we go. So you, you pick left, right, east, west, whatever, wherever you go, it don't matter. And so, you've, you know, camps there by the wrong place, right? And that's usually what happens to us when we choose our choice. Instead of letting God, we usually find ourselves in not a nice place. Like we see Sodom and Gomorrah and all these lands of the plain. It's a mess. These kings go to war and they overthrow their kings where Lot's living and they take him, his, his possessions, everything. Abraham hears about it. You know, it's like God sees what the enemy wants to do. He sees what the world wants to do. Even within our own flesh, when those things that we desire aren't, uh, I'm going to crook it, I think. Here we go. I look, I look off kilter. Okay. And, um, the things that God shows us, right, is well, how we see here in Abraham that when we choose the wrong decision in the world or in the flesh, you know, and, and kind of led away into a place where, like Lot in Sodom, next to, you know, worldly town and corrupt and evil, they're wicked. The Bible says they were. So why would we want to be around that, you know? Why would we want to subjugate ourselves to that? But anyways... They get beat down, and Abraham hears about it. Abraham, what really God spoken to my heart about Abraham, it says that he took 318, I think that was the number, of his um, trained men, right? It says, so one of the survivors came in verse 13 and told Abraham, when Abraham had taken, heard that his his relatives were taken prisoner, he he assembled his three hundred and eighteen trained men. You know what God was speaking to me about? What did Abraham train these men in? Was it in guerrilla warfare? Were they you know Navy SEALs? Were they Marines? Were they trained Army Navy? You know were they a militia? Were they the Proud Boys? You know, were they Antifa? Well, 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 how did he disciple and train these men? And the Lord, you know what the Lord showed me and spoke to me was he trained them to work in unity. Just like when we read, we were reading them, the Tower of Babel, that if you can get people to work together as a team, train unity, train the same goal, train for the same accomplishment, training for the same outcome, you will be successful. That's what I felt that the training that Abraham gave these 318 men was follow my lead and do as, a, you know, with the same heart, same vision, same motive, you know, that, that we will accomplish. These men were used to following Abraham. They were used to coming under his authority. They were used to listening to him and following his lead and, and being obedient and working together in unity. If Abraham, let's, let's do this. It was accomplished. Whatever he said is, 
he prospered. He was wealthy. He, you know, it was like no expense spared. God blesses. And I, and I believe that that really spoke to me about unity. Abraham with 318 men defeats five plus kings that defeated other nation, other kings with their armies. It's like, wow. So unity and obedience and submission is powerful. So he brings him back and here it is that Abraham returns from defeating Shaldalamar, kings, king of Sodom and came out and said, hey, man, this is, this is great, you know? And Melchizedek shows up. He's the type of Jesus, right? Melchizedek came up, Satan brought out bread and wine and he was priest to God most high. And he blessed him and said, Abraham is blessed by God most high, creator of heaven and earth, and blessed be God most high who has handed over your enemies to you. In acknowledging your enemy is my enemy, that Abraham was about bringing, a, bringing about God's blessing, God's presence, God's covenant, God's laws. God's, you know, rule in a society, in, in a, you know, in a family, in whatever aspect, Abraham valued God, number one. So Melchizedek honors that and says, man, you're blessed. And it says that Abraham gave him a tenth. And the king of Sodom and hits up Abraham, hey, man, you know, just give me the people, but you can have what you want. And Abraham says, man, I don't want nothing from you. I don't want nothing from the world. I don't want nothing from Sodom or Gomorrah or any of you kings. You guys are wicked, tore up, evil, demonic, you know, godless. And uh, I don't even want a little a sandal strap or a shoelace from you guys. I don't want nothing from you because I don't want you to dare say you have any attachment to me to say, oh, I made Abraham rich or I'm why he's blessed or I'm, you know, it was all about God. That's what we really need. I think I got too much stealing, huh? <laughs> Let me get up there so I can fill the whole the whole picture. Praise God. But so Abraham is visited by God and God confirms a covenant. And he says, man, how am I going to, you know, be blessed? You know, God said, I'm your reward. In that battle that he did and all the blessings and stuff that's going on, God confirmed one important thing in his life. God was his reward, not possessions, not lands, not, you know, getting his nephew, all this stuff. It was, I'm your reward. And I really feel that that's what we as Christians really need to have in our heart. That all we really should desire is God, his peace, his presence, his love, his power. Because when we get that, everything else comes. Success and and victory and and even if we go through hard times and battles, we still have peace. We still have his presence. Nobody can take that away. And uh, there's a dark prophecy spoken over Abraham. God tells him, I want you to bring me an offering. You know, uh, bring me a, a cow, a female goat, a ram, a turtle dove, and a pigeon. And offer these as a sacrifice. So here it is. He gets these at sacrifices and lays them out and it's taking God a while to answer you know it's getting late the sun's dropping and he's has to fight off vultures you know trying to eat his sacrifice and he's like God where are you well he pat he he dozes off and then a dark shadow appears and and he prophesies that they're gonna be you know enslaved and oppressed in a nation, but when they come out, they're going to bring many possessions and then you will return and worship here because the Amorites has not yet its full measure of sin. It's like God's waiting for, you know, us or the world to have enough of the sin of, of whatever so that we learn, you know, the right from the wrong. Praise God. So it says a flaming torch and a fire passes through the uh, offerings. It's like, that's what we need. 
We need the fire and torch and presence of God to pass through our heart. Like the, the animal sacrifices were cut in half. It's sort of like we need to open up our hearts, tear this flesh open, rip it open and expose our hearts so that God's fire can touch us. So God's fire can seal us. So God's fire can purify us to a place of acceptance and love for him. Why? Because Matthew chapter 5 says, you know where adultery starts? In the mind, in the heart. It's not the act. Once you start thinking and, and fantasizing, you're done. It's, it's already, you've lost the battle. Jesus begins to say, you've heard people tell you, right? You've heard other preachers, you've heard other guys quote the Bible. He goes, but what about you? I'm going to tell you what it's about. Many times, Jesus keeps repeating this phrase. You have also heard that it was said, and you've heard that it was said. But I'm telling you, you've heard rumors, you've heard stories, you've heard messages, you've heard sermons. But I'm going to tell you, we need to get one-on-one -on -one with Jesus and let him speak to us his commands, his love. You know, what the real principle of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Yeah. But he says, don't. Man, that's crazy. If somebody slaps you on the left, give them the right too. It's like, my God, the Lord's asking a lot of us. But he paid the heaviest price and gave himself for our salvation. He goes so far as to say he loved your enemies. Pray for them. Even if they persecute you, you know, what good is it if you're like everybody else? You love the good and you hate the bad. Or you like good people, but you hate bad people. You can't have that in your heart. You can't have that because God made us all. He says, if you only greet your brothers and sisters who are, what are you doing any better than anybody else? You know, you have to be like, he says, be perfect, therefore, as your heavenly Father is perfect. Lord, man, I need that one hardcore, big time. I need to have love for everybody in all times and all situations. And that only happened by his spirit. Psalm 6, what a powerful psalm of prayer. We need God's mercy. Our nation, our churches, our families, you know, our lost loved ones, those that are inflicted with COVID and in this year of 2021, my Lord, do we need more than ever. These Psalms, this one especially says it's to be sung with a string instrument. It's supposed to be worship and sung unto God. According to a specific Shemaneth, hallelujah. Shemaneth is like the worship of the heart and of the, the spirit, the, the sound of the, of the river of life flowing, the sound of the breath of God speaking. That's the sound. It's not so much, I think, really, that's a new revelation for me right now. It's not just stringed instruments and horn instruments and percussions and cymbals and, and all this fanfare of noise and the synth and this, this beat and this rhythm and this key and the sound, but it's about the heart and the spirit of God. It's about speaking hallelujah by the presence and power of almighty God. He says, have mercy. You know, when I'm sharing or I'm preaching or I'm, you know, trying to expound on the word, I need to be careful because he says in Psalm 6, listen, everybody's going to get rebuked. We're all going to get disciplined, but please, Lord, not when you're mad, right? And not in your wrath. That's funny. That's like, he understands God. He goes, okay, God, just before you deal with me, I know I got you upset. I know I shouldn't have did that, but please, man, just time out. You know, David's telling God, time out, you know, uh, take a deep breath, Lord. You know, I know I blew it, you know, so I want to pray for mercy. I'm weak, you know, and, and so, <laughs> he says, Lord, rescue me, man. Save me because of your love. Then he says, he says, look at in verse five. If I die, who's going to sing? If I die, who's going to praise you? You know, it's like, I ain't no good in the grave. You know, at least now I can, you know, dance and sing and I have that opportunity, right? So, you know, Please 
have mercy. You know, give me some, give me a little time here, you know, to worship because dead people don't praise you. So don't let me die. Hallelujah. And, uh, and he's really, I mean, his heart is crying out. Rescue me, Lord. You know, I'm, I'm praying, I'm sacrificing, I'm weeping. My pillow is soaked with my tears. Could you imagine that? Travailing in prayer and intercession to where your pillow is soaking wet with tears. My Lord. And because he understands all of his enemies. There's just a battle here, a battle in the flesh, a battle with the devil, a battle with your neighbors, a battle with the kids, or you're battling here. And it's a it's a constant battle. It's like, oh my God. And he finally says, you know what? Depart from me. You know, God finally, I'm crying. I say, Lord, please, please. He gets a breakthrough. And he says, man, depart from me. Be gone. Get behind me in the name of Jesus. Quit. You know, he takes authority and control because he knows that God heard him. God spoke to him. God gave him confirmation. God gave him revelation. God gave him restoration. I'm telling you, power prayer warriors, we need to continue to fight in our prayer and in the word and worship, doing warfare, that revelation, restoration, and repentance would come. Oh, praise God. He says, the Lord accepts my prayer. Hallelujah. Man, Proverbs 1, 29 through 33 tells it like it is. Because they hate knowledge and don't fear God, they're not interested in the word of God. They're not interested in the truth. They're not interested in... God's love. It's like God's trying to reveal his love, give his love, you know, share his love that we would experience it. And people are like, I don't want it. I reject it. I don't believe it. I don't want to accept it. I don't want nothing to do with it. And he goes, my God, he goes, these people are going to be filled with destruction of their own evil schemes. It says that they're apostatized. For their apostasy of turning away from truth, of turning away from God's spirit, of rejecting God's word and his love and his compassion and his mercy. He says they're going to be destroyed. They're fools. Lord have mercy. But whoever listens, hallelujah, to the 420 power prayer warriors, <laughs> they'll be blessed. Have a blessed day, prayer warriors. Let me turn this off.